So I got a message this week from somebody saying, would you like to do a Q&A session? And I said, yeah, sure, why not? And if you're into your Betfair football trading or you do anything in football markets, then you must know who this chap is because the chap is Sykov. And Sykov and I go back a long way because he was actually one of my first ever customers. And um, we have a little bit of history there, but if you want to find out a little bit more about that history and also some of the questions that people ask during this session, then watch the rest of this video. If you're interested in learning to trade on Betfair, then visit the Bet Angel Academy, where you have detailed, structured Betfair trading courses. Or why not visit our website where you can download a free trial of Bet Angel Professional, but also visit the forum where you can get detailed images, examples, and downloadable files. And don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and click on the bell icon if you want notification of new videos as they're released. Good morning, people. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, this is our first trial with Peter, so uh, we may have some problems uh, in this session. Uh, so in advance, if we have any issues or any problems, please forgive me. Uh, it will totally be my problem because Peter is my guest. I offered him to join me and uh, he accepted my uh, offer. So this is totally my plan. So if something goes wrong, uh, it's totally, uh, it will be totally my fault. Uh, I'm, I plan the question and answer session uh, today with Peter, uh, and it will be about football and horse racing, as you uh, ima can imagine. Give some reactions if you want to ask uh, any questions in any topic. Did you um, want to start with how we met? Because um, you came over to see me back in 2009, but we'd sort of been having conversations prior to that so maybe um, we can open with that while people are looking to ask some questions sure and, and if you want to listen to better english peter will help you <laughs> for this i mean it's because uh, you um, became a better angel customer i can't remember when it was a uh, quite quite some time ago wasn't it you must have been fairly early on, but I don't know the exact date at which you started trading. It was uh, it longer was ago than I think most people think. Yes, it was 2005 when I first started. When you first launched your Betangel software, which, yeah. in which year? Um, which we, year was it? it we, formally, it was launched in 2005. So five we, um, yeah we, we it was available in 2004 but not properly launched so you you would have been one of the first customers uh yes uh and your software uh really give me the thinking of trading because it it's it becomes uh, available with your software without the software uh, of betangelo or others uh, it's really very difficult to to trade, uh, especially in my style. Uh, so after discovering that there is a software which I can buy and sell very fast, uh, then I thought that it's, it can be used for making profit in the markets, especially in football, because I, I've been watching football for many years. Uh, so it gave me the idea uh, to, to start trading, scalping, and other strategies. Uh, so Bet Angel is is one of my uh, first uh, good things in my life. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, there have been many many more good things in your life since then. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, and then and then we actually met in two thousand and nine. I don't know if you remember the exact date. But yes, sure, sure, sure. Uh, I recently I saw. The letter, which which is a confirmation letter letter of our uh, hotel uh, reservation, uh, my my friend, uh, you can remember him. Uh, yeah. He 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 sent me three or four months ago. He he sent me the letter, a confirmation letter, which is a good memory. Uh, I it should be in summertime, I think. 
in uh, maybe June, July, or something like that. Yeah, it was um, July um, 2009. Was um, ah, because I went off and found the same confirmation as well. <laughs> I thought it'd be interesting <laughs> to see when it was because I had in my my mind sort of roughly when it was, but I had to try and uh, think when it was. So I went off and and I, I didn't want to come on here and say something that was wrong. But yeah, July 2009. Uh, so me and my friend, uh, if some of you watched one, one of my interviews over it, read uh, one of my interviews before, uh, you will see we started this uh, journey with a friend. Uh, we were two, uh, and he, he was, he is bigger, older than me. Uh, and we s decided to visit Peter's course, and it was our first visit to the UK. We were living in the in Turkey in these days. I've been living in the UK for three years now. Uh, so we visited uh, Peter's uh, course. Uh, it, it was a really good start for me, even though I'm not, I wasn't interested in horse racing. Uh, it was a good start for me and it changed my looking to trading to, to be a professional uh, and it completely changed my way of thinking. Uh, I have tried some horse racing trades afterwards but as I said I am never interested in horse racing. I, I find it very boring uh, to just look, look at pre-race numbers uh, and some changes. Um, but it really helped me too much as I said to understand how a professional thinks, how a professional uh, acts in the markets. It, it's very, very impressive. It was very impressive for me to, to see that. And, and my uh, trading completely changed, I can say. I, I started to be a professional after 2009. Uh, my, my bank, uh, my, my uh, environment, my uh, set up, everything started to change. Uh, so I started to behave like a professional after uh, visiting his uh, course. You see, we've got a few uh, questions so coming through. I've noticed on uh, chat we've got a couple of questions. So do you want me to um, ask those questions? Uh, because I'll, I'll answer one of the first questions that we've got um, on here. Um, okay. So that we can sort of kick things off, and and there is a question that could apply to both of us, uh, just below it. Okay. But the first question I've got uh, from Rob, whose Zoom name curiously is Donna Warren. <laughs> I'm guessing you're using somebody else's computer, <laughs> or you have two identities. Um, it's it's uh, basically he's asking me. Um, you often say that um, a horse is too high or low when I'm actively trading. Uh, what stats or knowledge guide you on that? So I thought that was quite a good question. But uh, so thanks, Rob, for the question. But typically when you're, because I predominantly trade order flow, so I'm trying to understand and estimate where the traded range is in a particular market. So some of that will be based upon prior knowledge. So a handicapped market, uh, and about 50% of all races are handicaps, tend to have repeating patterns in them. So you know how far something is likely to move. Um, in a certain type of handicap, but also the other activity within the market. If, if the favorite is coming in quite dramatically, um, that has to stop at some point, unless if there's something unusual going on, and therefore that naturally puts a limit above or below where the current price is. So if a horse is being consistently backed, um, you can see in the market when that activity is beginning to die out. So very frequently a horse will get backed significantly. And um, you end up seeing that the price and something else is coming in, that the amount of money is drying up. And at that point, you realize that it's just not going to go any lower. So often I'll make those judgment calls at that particular moment in time. But um, it's quite possible, given your experience, uh, to be able to identify roughly the, the range in which something is likely to trade. And it's not impossible for it to go beyond that, in which case you have to cut out for a loss. But when it sits within that particular range, you get more and more confident that it won't go any further. Um, part of that's experience, part of it is understanding the type of market you're trading, um, but all markets tend to have limits. Uh, so I tend to trade off of those limits, that's how I tend to trade. Um, there's a question, uh, actually it says, 
we could probably both answer this question. There's a question from Nemo, uh, which says, can a reliable edge be found in running? So I think both of us could answer that. So maybe you want to answer that first for football first. Uh, can a reliable edge be found in running? So in football, if the, if the, you know, you obviously trade everything in play and you obviously have an edge, which I think sort of answers the question, but I think it's a, it's a broader one saying almost, uh, sh should I be attempting to do this? If, if this is a question, uh, like a golden receipt or, or golden bullet, uh, there, there, as you imagine, there, there is, there is not. Uh, but of course, I have some edges. Uh, first of all, uh, is reading the match and reading the odds. I always say that uh, when you are watching football game live, uh, the, the biggest edge is the pricing is not always very accurate and not always very correct. Uh, but in pre-match, uh, they are. 99% very accurate and it's very difficult to beat them. You, you need to know something uh, different and something more important than the bookies to, to beat them. If you have the same knowledge with them or less, uh, then they will beat you in the long term. Uh, so that's why I, I don't uh, try to uh, trade pre-match. But in live game, uh, it's it's impossible for the bookmakers to give 100% accurate odds. It's, it's really impossible because the, the game itself is a very dynamic uh, thing. It, it changes, there, there's a dangerous position, there, there is a breakthrough. There, there are lots of things, there's a free kick, corner, uh, and the market can't set the odds uh, according to the game. It, it just gives uh, some statistical odds uh, and changes the odds uh, with the behaviors of, of the traders like us. If we want to buy or back, let's say, uh, something, then the odds, uh, I'm talking about under odds, for example, in, in, any, mar in, in any match. Uh, if lots of people are trying to get unders, then the odds uh, decreases. Then if lots of people are trying to lay the unders, then it uh, drifts. Uh, and so in terms of the edge, uh, the biggest edge in the markets is uh, understanding the odds, uh, especially understanding the false odds uh, and getting the advantage from them. Uh, that, that's all I can say. There, there are lots of uh, edges. There are lots of strategies uh, which I uh, mentioned in my course. Uh, but the, the most important one is uh, understanding the odds. Without understanding the odds, without this, um, it's, it's very difficult to be successful. Uh, it's all about pricing uh, at the end of the day. And when you're what watching a game, you're sort of it? looking at the game and you're saying, um, I understand what's going on with the game. I think I get a feel for where things are and I, and I think that this price is wrong. That's sort of essentially what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so on, I mean, on, on the racing side, because I know Rob sort of aimed it in that area as well, um, or sorry, Nemo did. Um, the, the, the interesting thing about um, racing is I can race read very well, simply because I've watched hundreds of thousands of races now. And I think if you combine a bit of race reading with um, what you think should be happening on the course, then I think that you'll trading is very often about anticipating that something is about to happen. So being able to get in front of that is the key to a lot of trading. Um, but when you look at horse racing and running, of course, you're up against people that are probably watching it um, at the course itself. But having met um, a number of different people who are trying to do stuff at, at the course, I think I've seen varying interpretations of, of what you could consider a trading strategy on course. Um, but if you're looking for an edge, um, then you tend to look at it by uh, race distance and the construction of the race. So if you do a five furlong race, the issue that you'll have is it's going to be over very quickly. Uh, the break at the start of the race will be critically important. And if a horse has the lead as it comes around the bend, um, then it will probably hold on to that lead. 
But if you're looking over longer distances and courses with a strong draw bias, uh, then the outcome is much more uncertain. Now, while I'm predominantly a pre-off trader, I have some automation that runs um, in play. And that's simply because when I, in the summer, when I finish one race, I turn my attention to the next and start trading it. Um, and I don't really have time to sit and watch how the race unfolds. I will have it on in the background. Um, but I have a little piece of automation that picks off prices um, in, during the in-play period. Um, but that will typically wait until after the break and um, it won't get involved in the market too late, uh, simply on the basis that in those last few furlongs, the market's pretty chaotic. But um, if you're looking to do something in running, then basically if you understand course and distance um, and the running style of the runners, then that will give you a clue as to where your edge is. You're under no obligation to trade every single market, so you're, you should be looking for an opportunity to occur and then jumping on that opportunity, not trying to just replicate the same thing one market after the other. It's the most common mistake I see in trading. It's people take a general trading strategy and then apply it to every market. And of course, that's impossible. That can't work. Did you want to look Thank for you. a question um, and answer or bring one up or do you want me to look for another one? Uh, we can continue from Gary oh. F. Do you mainly or only trade live games and do you predominantly stick to football? I think it's for me, yes, uh, I only trade uh, football and only live games. Uh, the next one, I think it's again about football. There's much more liquidity in some markets. You can pick any questions if, if you... Okay, see. I'll answer a couple of the, the quick ones above it. Um, oh, there was, okay. There was, um, Tony was saying, it, 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 why is there no bet angel for um, markets mm -hmm. or something similar to that? I've, I've, I talked to all the exchanges and I have talked to all the exchanges at one point or another about many different things. But um, I, I think that when you look at something like markets that most of the APIs is sort of heavily restricted to certain uh, types of use. And I think that, I'm not saying that they fear, but um, there's no enthusiasm for basically broadening that and making it a much more complicated issue. So somebody like a Betfair or a BetDAC um, has thousands of people plugging into the API and uh, markets haven't really shown that much enthusiasm for that sort of thing. So I think that um, perhaps they're not so um, keen to, to do that for a number of reasons. But from our perspective, um, I don't think that there's really enough demand to justify doing something like BetAngel in its full form. It may be possible um, to do a, a lighter version of the product, but for that we need markets to really buy into the whole API type thing, uh, which they haven't done at this particular moment in time. Uh, Stephen asks, there is much more liquidity in some markets than there usually would be because of the lack of matches available. Have you noticed this presenting any new opportunities? Uh, yes, it's very obvious, uh, especially in these uh, unusual days that uh, especially Belarus League or the Bundesliga in these days, uh, the prices or the liquidity is uh, insanely high in these matches because all of the world is uh, focusing on these games. But if you ask me if it brings us some opportunities uh, or not, uh, I am not sure about it because uh, this is a rule. If if the world is focusing on a single game and there is a very big liquidity in just a single game. Uh, it means that there are lots of uh, big fishes, sharks uh, in that sea as well, uh, which means they are watching the live game very fast. Uh, they are trading with very big amounts. So it uh, makes your moves uh, more difficult uh, than usual. Um, so if you ask me, I don't prefer uh, trading in a very high level game uh, like World Cup final or championships final. Uh, I prefer uh, big games, uh, uh, it's for sure, yes, uh, but not the biggest game of the market. Uh, so 
in in these days, uh, nearly all all games playing are playing with very uh, high liquidity. I'm I'm not happy with this. Uh, so I don't think it's a opportunity for my style. I can say uh, it's it's interesting actually because um, on the uh, secondary racing markets for me in France and Germany um, and Australia have all seen massive amounts of increase in liquidity, uh, which I thought was was interesting to see. Um, it's been beneficial for me in Australia, but I've really not seen that much difference in trading conditions in France and Germany. And um, I can see how higher liquidity would, would generally be a problem because I've tended to find that um, bigger markets tend to get stuffed up with a lot of money and they often tend to be slightly more efficient and so for the fill rate falls down and it can be a little bit harder to trade more effectively. But um, it, it's interesting to see that there has been uh, such a big increase in liquidity. There's a question here from Graham who's asking what will the liquidity be like on Monday when racing returns? And I'm hoping that it's going to be absolutely massive. <laughs> I don't know that it will be, but I think that um, uh, on Newcastle, they've had over 400 entries into the racing on Monday. They've had over 400, uh, nearly 500 entries to Kempton on Tuesday. So that seems to be a lot of interest. So maybe initially we'll see an, a massive increase in liquidity but I get the feeling it will fall away uh, from there. The problem I have with these markets is they're quite low grade markets. So I'm not expecting them to trade particularly well, but I hope that I'm wrong and that it's an absolutely fantastic day next, next Monday. Um, but yeah, it's, it's been interesting to watch how the markets have um, reacted to the lockdown because certainly from Bet Angel as a business, we saw all of the activity just vanish um, almost immediately. But uh, there's a lot of interest now. Support's been much busier over the last week or so. So I think people are really chomping at the bit to get back and do something. Did you want to pick another question? Sure. Uh, I think this is uh, after my first answer. Do you then suggest your eyes are the greatest asset in play in football? And pre-game stats and research are only 20% of the whole potential profit picture. Uh, yes, we can say that. Uh, eyes uh, and, and pricing knowledge, I can say. Uh, I, I mentioned in my interviews that I don't rely on uh, pre-game stats, research or anything. Uh, so even 20% is, is a much... Uh, number it's even less for me maybe 10 maybe 5 i don't look at pre-game stats or in play stats any statistics any knowledge any injured players any red cards uh, it, it doesn't interest me uh, what interests me uh, is what i see how i price them the actual price uh, and the difference between them it's, it's very simple uh, i know how I always give this uh, example, uh, it's like an Apple advertisement, but I know how, what would be this, the price of this Apple products. And I see some Apple products in the market. I can compare them easily. And if I think that it's cheap, I buy them. If I see that it's expensive, I sell them, that's, that's all. So it depends on, as you said, my eyes, reading the game, comparing the odds, uh, and deciding which side uh, I will be on, on the game, on, on the back side or on the lay side, uh, and when, uh, and how long. Uh, yes, you can pick any question if, if you can see. So yep, I'm just busy. scrolling down to have a look. Okay. The um, uh, Joe is saying, uh, has asked me a question following up from uh, a response I gave earlier. Uh, uh, doesn't running automation overnight in Australia mean that you're applying a similar strategy to all those markets? No, it doesn't, um, because the automation uh, chops and changes um, between individual markets. So 
one of the things that's really that I've worked out fairly quickly on that I've really is my mantra is that for every market there's a strategy and every strategy a market and your role as trader is to join those two up so if you deploy one strategy well in a market it will perform well in some markets and not in others so you drop that strategy for markets where you know it's not going to work um, but in other markets uh, you would do something slightly different so I always vary um, my trading depending upon uh, what I expect to see and the same goes in automation the automation that I've done has been, we've had automation in VetAngel pretty much since day one via Excel, but for over 10 years now in more complex terms uh, via the product itself. Um, so most of the strategies that I have have been built up over a long period of time and just gradually tweaking and varying and then um, deploying slightly different strategies and modifying the automation from there. So they get quite complex over a period of time. Uh, but yeah, typically you'll, you'll have a, uh, there's a couple of questions here on strike rates. Um, you've always got to remember that when you're looking to win money in the long term, it's all about the amount you win, the amount you lose, and how often you win and lose. It's never good enough just to say you've got a certain strike rate um, or that you win a certain amount. You, it's a balance of all of those things. So I'll win on about seven or eight races out of ten. Um, but I'll generally win more than I lose. So that's, that's where my profitability comes over time. Um, so strike rate's important, but it's part of a larger equation. Uh, there's a thing question here I can see, um, oh, oh. which is quite relevant to you, which is asking uh, what markets do you tend to trade when you're trading football in play? Is, is this, this, yeah. this question, yeah. uh, what, yeah. what are the most common markets in play? Oh, okay, I was about to answer that. Uh, I uh, mostly play in under over markets, uh, match outs, uh, and the correct score markets uh, because these are the most liquid ones. Um, I, I don't prefer goal lines or handicaps because there isn't not much liquidity or and later draw is not something that I uh, trade on uh, which funds do you avoid if there is very low liquidity in any market I try to avoid these markets because it uh, makes difficult to hedge my position or close my position if there is not uh, good liquidity in any market uh, so I, I'm my style is very simple, uh, honestly. It's correct scores, it's under overs, and it's match outs. Uh, another question from the Scorpion. Uh, he congratulates me on the day before his Bundesliga action. Uh, I posted a profit and loss screen, uh, about 15K, uh, and Lots of people attacked me as usual after <laughs> posting that uh, <laughs> Twitter post. Uh, I think it comes for a part. It's part of the course, isn't it? It's in, it's impossible <laughs> to do or show anything without somebody getting upset about it. So yes, I try to ignore the negative comments in my Twitter. I I think you do because lots of people are attacking uh, us. Uh, and they are always trying to hit us with the same questions. First one, uh, why are you always posting the green ones? Uh, please post red ones. Uh, when we post some green greens, it doesn't mean that we, we don't have reds. Of course, we, I, I have reds. I, I'm sure that Peter have lots of reds as well. Uh, but I don't see any point of posting any unsuccessful trades. Uh, like Barcelona football team is uh, posting the very best goals of Messi. I have never seen any uh, his misses uh, posted by Barcelona club or, or unsuccessful free kicks or something like that. Uh, everybody wants to show their success uh, in, in the social media. Uh, it's not for ego or something like that. Uh, it's It's for uh, saying that we are, I am here at least, I, I can't talk uh, on behalf of Peter, but it means that I am still here, I am still strong, I am still trading. Uh, 
Um, th yeah, that's I mean, all, not, nothing else. I, I very often post stuff just to show that I'm still active because I think, you know, 20 years yes, is a long it. time to be in the markets. And, um, and I actually trade because I enjoy it and I love the challenge of it. That's, that's probably the biggest buzz that I get from it. Um, so I want to show people that I'm still active. Um, but like, like I've said fairly consistently, I'll get a three out of 10 wrong. Um, but by the end of the week, it generally doesn't mean that much to me because I've traded so many markets, especially on racing in the summer, you can trade hundreds of markets um, and it all sort of comes out in the wash. So uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think that um, you just accept that you're going to get a stick, whatever you do, it seems impossible to please everybody. Yes, I watched one one of your videos, which is about this topic. Why I post uh, these ones, and I completely agree with you. It's uh, for showing that I'm active. I'm still here. I'm still successful because uh, we are trying to. I have just started, uh, but you have doing courses for years, and we need to show people that we are successful as well because we are trying to sell our knowledge. Uh, so when you try uh, want to buy some knowledge from someone, uh, don't you want to know that he is successful or not? So this is the way that uh, I can show uh, you that I'm successful and I'm keen on uh, selling my knowledge to you with, with my courses. So this is, this is the way of uh, showing my success in the markets. Uh, I uh, har hardly block uh, my followers. I, I don't do this. I don't want to do this. But if there are some people here which I uh, blocked from Twitter, uh, uh, sorry, it, it, there may be two reasons for that. One, uh, you can you might be write something uh, in my very bad time and uh, I can do this with with, uh, with a temper, which is very rare. The second one, uh, I have a three-step uh, evaluation. I first ignore, this is first step. I Second step, ignore again. But in third step, I block. If, if some people, same people are writing the same thing and abusing me, uh, swearing me, uh, I don't have uh, any patience for these kind of followers because this is to be, this is not a blog, this is not a uh, forum. Uh, so you click to follow me, so you are you are, you don't want you don't need to uh, uh, bully me or abuse me in my page. Uh, so I need to block, and, but this is not anything that I want to do. Uh, so there is a question about this Bundesliga Knights. Uh, he asks if the profit comes from a particular match. Where was it? Was that all based in one match uh, or the profit from trading all five? Uh, I remember that night. Uh, that 15k came came from uh, three matches predominantly. Uh, I I don't remember the names of the matches. I I. Uh, forget them very easily, but one of them was th the biggest match of the day, Bayern Munich uh, versus Dortmund. Uh, if you remember, the, I think the extra time was three or four minutes. I, I guess it was three. Uh, and there, there was a penalty appeal uh, in the box. Uh, and the market was unsure about the, the referee will go to uh, to monitor, to to watch or not, uh, so there was a fluctuation in in the prices, and I made a very big uh, profit in that market, about 5k, uh, because lots of people thought that uh, the referee will go to the uh, monitor and uh, he can give give a penalty. Uh, the second one, uh, it, it it came from a uh, set piece, is a kind of a free kick. I, I have a late. Uh, in one position, and it went and uh, a goal happened. The second one came from that match. And the third one, it should be Freiburg, or uh, I don't remember the team. I, I laid uh, the winning team uh, in the last five minutes uh, of the game. Uh, and the, in the last minute, it was an own goal, I remember that. Uh, with the own goal, uh, the match came 2-2. 
so my third winning came from that game. Uh, so the success of that night came from three matches, not only one. Uh, I can rattle off a few quick questions here with some quick sure. answers. Um, the, uh, Tony says, will there ever be anything that will accurately predict where you are on a queue for an unmatched bet? Um, unlikely. Uh, that would mean exposing the order queue from Betfair. But even if you were able to uh, expose the order queue from Betfair, you still don't know what's waiting in the wings. Uh, somebody will iceberg an order in um, or try and place repeat orders. So I think any strategy that you have should be removed away from trying to predict where you're on the queue. Um, we obviously have tools like the position in queue um, estimated indicator in BetAngel. But it's just a guide. It's not a, a definite. You should use it to aid your trading, uh, but not be completely reliant upon it. Uh, Chris says, can you trade horse markets purely on price action? Yes, you can. That's exactly where I started. Over many years, I've uh, refined and updated my knowledge on the market. So I've got better as I've acquired more knowledge. Um, so for example, it won't post lockdown, I won't be able to do this. But when the racing gets back to normal, I can look at a market that's going to take place tomorrow and roughly tell you how it's likely to trade, what range it's likely to trade in, and how much money it will match in play and in running. Um, so you tend to target markets that you you, you know you're going to like, um, but you can trade it purely on price action. You don't need to do any research at all if you don't wish to do so. However, it's quite a skill to be able to do that. Um, there's a question here on X Games as well, uh, which uh, the exchange games, saying, um, have you ever tried to use those? No. Um, because I'll give you a little story behind that. And that was when the exchange games came out, they are perfect markets, so you can price them perfectly because they're card games and stuff like that. Uh, but what everybody did was they set up servers in Malta, which was where the exchange games were run, and they would all heavily seed the markets. Um, immediately, the markets became um, open on Betfair. So Betfair actually banned people on exchange games markets that had an IP address from, uh, from Malta. So there was a, a big sort of turf war to price up those markets because it's basically a one-way street. You are the casino. Um, but in terms of actively trading in and out of those, there's no real opportunity because the markets are perfect. Um, and Betfair did stop the Maltese IP addresses from seeding those markets. Um, but I haven't looked at them since really. Um, there's no uh, no sort of business doing anything there because the markets are, are too well priced and and I don't know who who does that but um, there's no opportunity there. Um, Vlad has asked a good question. Theory. I can see you want to jump in, so if you want to take over. Uh, okay, uh, I'm completely agree with the exchange games of pet fairs. I've never tried it, and uh, I agree with you. Um, I saw a question here, predict, sorry, yes, it's from Sam. My main issue at the moment is that I am too hesitant when entering trades, either because I feel I may enter too many or they may not be value. Any advice on how to overcome this? I often, I often find after that you traded the games, I was too hesitant to enter. Uh, hesitation uh, is the is a symptom uh, that you are s still not sure uh, about what you are doing. It, it's while I'm uh, learning driving in the UK, uh, my uh, trainer always saying, don't hesitate because in the roundabouts, I was hesitating. It's my turn to pass or I sh should I wait? Uh, and my hesitation come from uh, my incompetency. So, takes time to feel confident and know what you are doing. Uh, but you don't hesitate if you see a, a opportunity in the market. For example, I mentioned uh, recently in the uh, extra time of Bayern Munich Dortmund game, uh, the opportunity came for seconds. If you hesitate, uh, you, you miss the opportunity and you need to wait for the next one. Uh, hesitation is not a good thing. Uh, but it's, it shows me that uh, you are still not 100% ready to uh, do what you are doing. So you need time. And to overcome this, you can use small stakes uh, at the beginning uh, while you uh, start to feel more confident. Uh, what I 
can suggest is uh, try uh, small stakes. When you see your success, uh, your uh, you will be uh, better uh, in the markets. The next one from Vlad. Uh, does it make sense to trade two markets simultaneously in the same match? For example, under 0 0.5 and over 1.5 when they are mispriced? Absolutely, yes. Uh, I recommend all of you to do this. Uh, open as many ladders as you can uh, in the market. Uh, because sometimes the opportunity uh, vanishes in in a particular market, but it continues uh, in, in the other market. So it's always makes sense to uh, have an eye on two or more uh, markets. To be honest, I, I use four markets in a, in a match. Uh, it's correct score, the match odds, under overs, uh, and the next under overs. Uh, I always try to have an eye on uh, four of them. Uh, okay, Peter, can you see yep. any relevant question? Yeah, yeah there's, I'm, I'm going to answer a couple, and then there's one that we can both answer. Um, but uh, Jim was asking whether I adjust my staking uh, based on the importance of the race, and the short answer to that is yes, I do. So if I trade a low-grade handicap on a Tuesday evening um, in the summer, my stakes will be absolutely minimal um, because those are the races that I probably – they do summer jumps racing. They, they won't do it this year. Um, but those races on a Tuesday evening in summer, I dislike the most. So I reduce my stake to quite small stakes. That's a good way of reducing losses. Um, but when it comes around to a Cheltenham or one of the big meetings like a Royal Ascot, then I will use the biggest stake that I possibly feel I can get away with. And by that, I mean I match the liquidity in the market. I've done a couple of videos on this um, that explain what I'm looking for in terms of liquidity but also how I adjust my staking. There's a video I think called variable staking. Um, and there's um, another one that's based around what, it, what am I looking for in a market in terms of liquidity? Both of those are worth watching. Um, the question that both of us could answer, um, and I'll answer it first and then hand it back to yourself, is over what length do you measure success? Is it um, a, a meeting daily, weekly, monthly, um, or a season? So, my view on that is um, I measure success over the course of an entire season because um, there's seasonality in all sports. And as a consequence, um, it trades differently. Um, it's certainly for me in terms of if I do tennis, you've got the, we should be doing the clay court season, which would be brilliant at this moment in time, but that's not going to trade the same way as the grass court season. And racing, uh, when you're looking at uh, jumps racing and running, that's going to be completely different from a five furlong on a, on a straight track uh, when you're looking at horse racing. So you have to measure yourself over the course of the year. And in racing terms, uh, when I talk specifically about that, February is a terrible month for me, not much happens. So I tend to holiday in February. Uh, but if uh, I'm looking at uh, June, July, or those critical periods such as uh, Cheltenham at March, um, then things are very good for me then. And if you're learning to trade, the problem that you could have is you may think that that dip in the market is down to your lack of trading ability, when in fact, it's just a natural lull within the market. But will I make money every day? No. Um, I had a quick look before I came on today to see when my last losing day was, and it was about two to three weeks ago. Um, but that's simply because there's not much on at the moment, and I'm doing a good job of what is on. Uh, so that's not a, a realistic or representative sample, but I wouldn't measure myself daily. Um, I expect to make money over the course of a week and I would expect to make it over the course of a month, but that amount will go up and down according to what sport is on, what I'm trading and the seasonality within that. So I don't know if you want to add to that um, specifically on football. Uh, there's a question from... Did you want to... Uh, it, how do you measure your success, Alison? Uh, sorry, I was... Looking very at much in right. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's very difficult for me to li listen <laughs> you and to read the uh, questions at the same time uh, in a foreign language. I'm I'm very sorry. I, I couldn't. Listen. I think you're doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, how so, do you pick which which games to watch? This is a very common question. Uh, 
uh, I'm trying to pick the biggest games in a, a busy schedule. Uh, I'm trying to pick the uh, s matches with surprising scores. For example, if there is a game Barcelona uh, playing with Malaga and they're three nil uh, up, then this game isn't so much interesting uh, in terms of uh, the odds uh, and the markets because the expectations are fulfilled. Everyone uh, was waiting an easy win for Barcelona and it's fulfilled. Uh, so there is no panic, uh, no, no, nothing very interesting. Uh, but let's imagine that Malaga is uh, ahead 1-0, uh, then there will be a panic in, in, the, in that market because lots of people uh, are seeing a score which didn't expect uh, at the beginning. Uh, some, so some of them are trying to uh, get some edge from the score. Someone is losing money, and they they are trying to hatch from uh, wrong odds. Uh, blah blah blah. So uh, big matches, uh, matches with unexpected scores. Uh, if one of the, one of the, one of uh, my strategies is catching a goal, so if I'm trying to catch a goal, uh, then I try to avoid from the matches which are going draw 0 0 1 1 2 2 uh, these are the main uh, criterias that I use when picking a game um, there's an interesting question uh, which I should read I don't understand how Ersan can save red cards injuries suspensions and lineups don't affect him uh, the odds are affected by the players on the pitch, not the name of the club. Uh, if the Tory was to ride a horse, I think he's a jockey. I don't know him. Horse and is swapped at the blah, blah, blah. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, I meant uh, I don't do any pre-game research. Uh, and I don't uh, read newspapers. I don't look at the news on the websites about the games because I rely on what I see on the pitch and not the games. For example, you can say Messi is injured and he's not playing. But if Barcelona is uh, playing very well and making pressure, then, then it's more important for me to know that Messi is not playing. It's not important for me. Messi is not playing, but Barcelona is playing very well. Uh, so it's it's worth uh, if the odds uh, are good, it's worth uh, backing Barcelona or, or vice versa. Messi is on the pitch, but he's doing nothing. Uh, or another thing, uh, yesterday the, the Redman team, uh, I don't remember which one was that. Uh, Leipzig, Leipzig, yes. Uh, Leipzig was t were 10 men and, and, they score, and they scored. Uh, who is not on mute, sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, Leipzig was were 10 men and they scored. So it, this is my style. I, I don't even say uh, this, this knowledge is useless. Don't look at them. Uh, in my style of trading, uh, I don't rely on this uh, information about red cards, about injuries. Uh, but I, I never say that these aren't important. I, so, some of my friends uh, I are using this uh, information as well, but this is my way of training. Yeah, I'm George, I have a couple of questions here. The, um, uh, I've forgotten the one I was going to answer. <laughs> Oh, the, I think there's a good question here that could apply to both of us. Um, it actually comes from Joseph and it's saying, um, Erson, when you started football trading, how did you fare? Um, and, and, you know, does that vary from what you do now? Uh, but it's almost equally as applicable to me as well um, in terms of when I started trading horse racing, I was actually trading football, financial markets, golf, everything other than horse racing. So when I first started trading on horse racing, I was absolutely useless because I just didn't have a clue what on earth I was doing. I didn't know what I was looking at, the way that the market worked. I didn't know that there was so much activity in the market in the last five minutes or why that was the case. 
So I, I was completely useless when I first started um, and had to build out my strategy from there. And typically the way you build a strategy is you, you just start avoiding mistakes. So even if you're a complete fool, you'll very often break even or sometimes profit. And in fact, learning from your mistakes is probably the most important thing that I did. Um, so I don't know how you started when you were started football trading. Did you just click a few buttons and then <laughs> hope for the best? Uh, my strategy really changed in years. I can see this clearly when I uh, think about the last 15 years. It's, it's always changed and still changing, evolving. Uh, the, the biggest difference uh, I, I can say is I was going uh, on lower odds uh, too much than today. Uh, which means backing for a uh, low odds, uh, which means higher possibility, uh, was attracting me uh, more than today. Uh, now I'm always uh, looking to lay at low odds, but in, in, in the beginning I was uh, more aimed to back on low odds because I was seeing that as a easy money. Uh, for example, at the last two minutes, if there is 1.15, 1.13, uh, I was trying to back them uh, and thinking that 15% uh, uh, profit, it's, it's very good for just two minutes. Uh, and after some time, I realized that it's it's not easy money and, and nobody is uh, stupid in the market. Some of them are, yes, but not all of them, especially if there is a big money there, uh, then it's it's very unusual that you you are f seeing some uh, stupid people. Uh, so it, it changed. Uh, now I'm trying to lay from low odds uh, instead of backing them. Uh, there there are lots of things changing a every year, uh, and it's not always coming from my strategy, it's sometimes come from the market dynamics as well. Markets are changing as well every year. Uh, for example, uh, the, the odds, uh, the behaviors of the markets, it's, it's changing every year and it's honestly becoming more difficult every year to trade and to get easy money uh, from the markets. It's, it's being more difficult every, every year. The, um, yeah, there's a question here from Shane saying, um, do you think there should be more people as successful as us? Um, and uh, why do people not get there? Is it mindset versus, versus skill? I, I can give an opinion on that. Um, the, there are loads of successful people, just not everybody puts themselves through being public. Oh, sure. and, um, and, and I know that Urson and I know loads of successful people who have absolutely no profile whatsoever. And when we started Bet Angel, it was important to me that anybody who joined my team learned to trade as well. And through that, I've learned that people have different attitudes to risk and ability to, to take risk. Um, so you do see quite a large variation in the people that are suitable for trading or not. Um, so I, I've taught my daughter to trade. She can trade profitably, but, she, but she's nothing like me at this moment in time. And I think part of that is because she's younger um, she got off to a really good start and everything was going really well. And then she had a couple of bad results and it all started to go backwards very, very quickly. And of course, she'd never had to deal with that before. Whereas, you know, I've done that many times over in my life through various circumstances. And I just said to her, carry on because you're doing fine. But, you know, you, you're just you've lost it in terms of your ability to trade. And if you go back to where you started, you'll you'll be fine. And sure enough, she sort of headed off in that direction. Um, but there are people within the, the team at Bet Angel that are as, as good as me. Um, they're not um, as high profile as me, but there's certainly plenty of people out there that actively trade. Did you want to add anything to that person? Uh, no. Uh, what's your average stake? Is it always the same? Vlad asks. Uh, no, it's not always the same. It depends on the market liquidity. Uh, and I try to use the uh, appropriate stake according to the market.
because if you play with various uh, big money in the market and the, if the market can recognize you easily, it's not a good thing. Uh, you need to be uh, invisible uh, in the market and not to change the market uh, with your moves. If you start to change the market, uh, it's not a good thing. Uh, my first aim is being trying to being invisible uh, in the market and to achieve that uh, I set my uh, stakes according to this uh, yeah. Shane asks if you answer my question about to read skills pre-match the data skill yes we answered this um, there's a good one here from Jim saying, is it worth holding off using a strategy next week, which is built on pre-lockdown data? If so, when do you think the markets will get back to normal? It, the, my, my view on that on, on the racing front is that um, I'm going to be trading those markets next week, but I'm also going to be gathering lots of data to try and understand what has changed, if anything has. So I think strategies that were built um, prior to that may behave differently on the first few days, but maybe after a week or so things may calm down, but certainly I'm expecting the markets to be a little bit different. I'm going to be watching that uh, very carefully. Um, I think Erson's already mentioned the Bundesliga and the, the impact that lockdown had on that. So I'm not sure that the markets will return to normal immediately. Uh, is it purely experience that tells you what is value or can this data be found online? Asks Nemo. Uh, I don't know any source uh, which tells that this this prize is value. This is not because it it varies for every game. It, uh, it's like pricing a car. Uh, yes, there are some presets values. For example, if I say you uh, a fifteen year old uh, Mercedes E. 200 uh, diesel uh, in good condition, then you may have a price on your mind, but you need to see the car uh, to exactly say its price and what should it be. Uh, it's the same for the mar uh, match, match as well. Uh, there are some preset odds in my mind, mind and I say to my uh, attendees, people in, in, in my courses, uh, but the, the main thing is experience as you say and i don't know any source that you can find online about these uh value odds i'll answer a couple uh, of things here um mm -hmm. as I said um do you think the likes of betfair should offer an endorsement to people who offer advice and my short answer is yes um will they do it probably not because a lot of the betting industry is built upon getting people to bet not to be profitable um, and as a consequence, most betting companies, including Betfair and others, um, will quite happily take articles or advice from people who have no uh, record of profitability. And, and, and that's not a controversial statement. That is a fact with the betting industry. That's the way that the industry works. They, they have a thing called bet stimulus. And the idea is most of the articles and advice that you see is designed to um, get people to do something. Um, and that's very different from giving proper advice. Um, so I, I would welcome something like that, but I don't think it will ever happen. I don't think there's any possibility that that will happen. Um, Joe has asked me, uh, Aussie Greyhound automation, how do you deal with races starting late? And there's a quick answer to that, which is why I'm squeezing it in. And that is I take my positions to SP and let them resolve at SP. So I do trade past post on automation on Aussie Greyhounds and any open positions go to SP. Makes the PNL very bumpy, uh, but it seems to work pretty well. So I suggest you do that. Do you want to uh, pick a question? I, I couldn't. <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to pick a relevant question. They Frank of you seem to get a lot of champagne trades and lazy matchups. Thank you. Actually, there's, there's a funny question in here that I'm going to throw at you. Um, it says, in Turkey, street backgammon is a common favorite betting pastime. I heard this on a podcast recently. When I went, I went to Istanbul for a wedding, um, and uh, we, I, I, got, I was lucky enough to spend I think, about a week 
um, in Istanbul and southern Turkey and the Mediterranean and stuff. But I was struck by the number of people playing backgammon. So why is that? Why is backgammon such a big thing in Turkey? Um, really, I don't know. Big, big backgammon is the every house has a, have a backgammon in in their house. I think every household has has it, uh, and we know how to play it when we were a child. Uh, our fathers know it well, so our father teaches how to play this game. Um, it's it's a cultural thing, I, I think. Uh, lots of people are playing this game. I had, had a, a, one of the funniest experiences of my life was um, when I was in Istanbul, and we'd, uh, there's that, a big main street that runs down the center with all the shops and the restaurants, and... Um, we had we were going out for a, a really big night and we ended up going from a, a restaurant to a nightclub and then another and we were finding anywhere that we could to carry on the night until the early hours of the morning and we eventually got thrown out of this nightclub um and there was the and there were these two guys playing backgammon so we joined them <laughs> we, <ordered some> drinks. <laughs> we sat there and waited for the sun to rise and we and like i my but backgammon skills are, are terrible. So everybody was having to explain everything to me. Um, but I've got to say that was one of the best evenings of my life. <laughs> uh, be before Betfair, I, I've been playing some online games for cash. Uh, one of them was backgammon. Uh, the other one was uh, Jin Rumi. It's a card, card game, a popular card game. Uh, and there were some websites uh, which uh, lets you to play these games online for cash. Uh, so before Betfair, uh, before 2005, I think I played these games for two or three years and I uh, get a nice profit and made my living from these card games. I, I was a student in in psychiatry in these years so it was a they were very really strange days oh there are lots lots of questions i'm, yeah, I'm just having a look here to see what um what questions we should have somebody saying uh, to me uh, do you catch yes in running automation strategies or pointers i'll give you a couple of pointers and that is don't put your position in the market before the race has started. You need to wait until the break um, has occurred before you attempt to do any strategy. But typically, you tend to find the market overreacts in both directions. People lay stuff uh, way too early before the, the chance of it winning is diminished, and people back stuff too quickly as well. So most of my strategies are around catching those extremes and, and trading out of positions rather than just letting it run as a bet. Shane asks, is the Premier League the most market efficient in play? Uh, definitely, yes. Uh, as a rule, uh, the more liquidity uh, means the more efficient the market is. Uh, so the Premier League is priced very efficiently. Uh, I can confirm this. Um, somebody said here, uh, Tony's asked me a question saying, why do people work for you when they could just do it on their own? <laughs> it's a good question. The, um, well, I, there have been people who've joined my team who have then left and gone off to do their own stuff. But generally speaking, we work as a team together um, on the product and uh, we do trade independently of each other. We don't collaborate in any way, um, but we find that um, working together allows us to pull uh, more as a team than we could actually get as an individual. So um, I just feel it's always important that if you've got a product that's based around trading, that everybody trades. I've always felt that that's the way um, that it should be. And I don't think that there should be any other way that um, you should be, you wouldn't have um, a, a group of car mechanics who weren't interested in repairing cars. So um, I built my team around that basis and thankfully most of them stick around. I picked two questions yep. how many strategies do you use per game uh, it depends on the game but uh, I have uh, four strategies that I mainly use uh, 
but sometimes I don't use all of them in in a particular game. It, it depends on how is the game going. Uh, but I, I don't have lots, 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 lots of strategies. Uh, I have very simple, easy looking, uh, and few strategies. But maybe my uh, edge is uh, executing them uh, with uh, very disciplined uh, and uh, very, very uh, with rules, uh, without any greed. Um, but I don't have lots of uh, strategies. The next one is, what markers do you sculpt in play? I uh, answered this. Do you wait until half time or the last 10? Uh, it's important, uh, if, especially if you are sculpting, uh, then you need to wait for the last 20, 25 minutes of the halves uh, because the price movement starts uh, in this period. Uh, in other words, at the end of each half, uh, you will not see any big price movement unless there is a very dangerous free kick or something unusual. So I, if I'm scalping in that match, uh, I tend to wait until the last 20 or 25. The, uh, this question to me is here saying, um, how big is the variance on trading horse races in terms of profit? Um, I don't, I never really, I always have this belief that the market will deliver what, what it, what it can to you. Um, it's, you, you're not, there's no obligation to take it and you won't, most certainly will not be able to get a hundred percent of it, but the market presents opportunities to you all the time, but the scale of those opportunities is going to change repeatedly. So you can't go into the market expecting to make a certain amount of profit. That's just not a valid way of trading. You go into the market based upon an opportunity and then you will get a profit out of it. Um, but certainly in terms of racing, that, that will vary dramatically. If we've got a, a low quality handicap or a, a maiden or a seller, I'm never ever going to get as much money out of that as I can a much bigger race simply because there's more money in the market. So liquidity and volume is very important to me and I'll push the boat out when those two are in the right mix, but on the lower quality stuff, I won't go for any particular target. So you tend to find that my overall aim is just to try, it's, it's slightly different from when you would trade in football, uh, but my overall aim is to just try and get something out of each market. And if I can't, then I'll try and get the smallest loss possible. So if you look at my bell curve, my losses are very small because I try and minimize them as much as possible, but I have what you would call a fat tail on the profits that I'll generally make profit. And sometimes I'll make a lot, um, but that the level of variability is very high in horse racing. You can't expect to do the same on every market. Michael asks my favorite two strategies. Uh, one of them is scalping for sure, uh, because I started trading with scalping. Uh, so I say scalping is like my son. I developed it. I uh, not in the world, of course, in, in my brain. I developed it, uh, and I have a different uh, style in scalping. And it's I when I say I developed it, I mean this. Uh, in classic scalping. Uh, you you open a position, you wait for a little time and close your position for a few ticks. Uh, but in in play football, uh, I execute scalping a little bit different, uh, maybe which makes me uh, different than uh, others. So scalping is my uh, favorite strategy by far. Uh, the second one uh, should be laying laying the lead, maybe, uh, because it's it's risk reward uh, ratio is very very uh, good, uh, especially laying the leading team uh, from very odds when they are uh, one or two, sometimes three goals ahead. Uh, laying them if I see any any light. Uh, in the losing team. Uh, I can say this is my second favorite mm, 
strategy? There's um, a couple of questions I can answer here. When building an automated strategy based on data, how far should you go back to build your strategy from? I've always, I've always looked at data in terms of attempting to build a strategy, but the, the problem that you always have with the data is you very often tend to find in it what you want. And um, that can be, uh, you, can, you can find a false positive, you, you find something that you think will work, and lo and behold, when you put it in the market, it doesn't work. Um, so I tend to use data to get an idea of the shape and feel of something. Um, but it's more important for me to actually put it to use in the market and get direct feedback from that. So there have been many things I've discovered by doing stuff in the market that I didn't think were possible or that I had missed. Um, and it was just through doing it in the market that I found those opportunities. You don't tend to find those opportunities in data. Um, it's the practical application of doing a trade tends to bring up opportunities itself. Um, and you, you don't tend to find that in data, but using the data, you can point yourself in roughly the right direction. So if I've got data, I'll gather and um, I, I collect data on everything all of the time, even if I don't use it, because it may be at some point in the future, I may go back and start using it. But I know I'm fairly unique in that respect. I waste a lot of time doing that, um, but I quite enjoy the analytical side. Um, there's a question below that as well saying, is it, um, do you be behave like Forex or stock traders? Trading pre off horse racing is very similar to that um, because it moves in a similar way to a foreign exchange market. It's, it's like a, a, a forex market on steroids. Uh, football is similar, but it's more like an options expiry because you have time to expiry on a football match as well as the volatility within the match itself. But you're probably in a better position uh, to comment on that, if the, the parallels between football and financial markets. Uh, especially in play... Uh, is something different than forex market because there is there is a reality at, on the pitch. Uh, something is happening, so uh, there is a reasoning of the price change uh, in play. But in pre race horse racing, uh, usually there is not a reasoning. Uh, the, the, the price change, uh, according to my knowledge, maybe maybe I'm uh, not correct uh, correct me if I'm wrong but in praise horse racing uh, the, the, the traders behaviors change the price uh, there is usually not an actual reason uh, to change change the price uh, so it's similar with the stock markets or others but but in, in play football uh, there's something playing there uh, for example if there is a corner the odds change according to those. If there is an injury or the game stops, the uh, odds uh, change according to this. Um, I think pre-match or pre-race odds are more similar to forex markets, but but not in play. Uh, for example, can you say that? Can you say that uh, in in play horse racing is any similar with forex markets? I don't think so because if when it's, it's in play. Uh, there is something happening there, and the odds are changing according to the horses who is uh, ahead, who is, who is on back. Uh, it's similar in football, but in, in praise or pre game, it's usually if there is not a big reason, for example, a big knowledge or information about the injury, a horse, um, something like that. If there is not not an information, important information, then uh, all the price change is. Uh, like uh, forex, I think. Yeah, no, I think it's I think just right. just my thought. Yeah, if if you look at um, in play racing, um, the only way you could get the same sort of movement in a foreign exchange market would be if really you knew. You know, well, I was going to say the the only way you could get it is if the uh, the government of the day decided that they were going to set interest rates um, on a, a weekly basis and they kept changing it by 10% <laughs> because the price would jump everywhere. Um, and of course that's not realistic in foreign exchange markets. It's much more gradual than that, that you get moments when um, the market does jump in foreign exchange markets, when there's a big decision or there's a government auction of gills. Um, but there's, there's no parallel, I think, between a foreign exchange market and in play. But certainly it looks very similar when you do stuff pre-off. Uh, so, 
Some of you said, can you keep the camera on the person who is talking? Uh, I don't know how to do this. If, if you write on the chat, I can happily uh, change this. And you can see only the person who is talking. Uh, I, I receive lots of questions about the streams uh, and the fastest pictures. This is uh, another common question. Uh, but there is not an easy answer for that. Uh, some of you ask about the Betfair uh, streams. Uh, I sometimes use Betfair streams uh, if I can't uh, have, I don't have uh, anything better. Uh, but you must be sure that there is not a only source that you can watch everything in the fastest way. Uh, it depends on the league. Uh, it depends. Uh, on something else, but it's always changing. For example, Betfair has some streams very fast. Betfair has some streams uh, use, uh, totally useless. Uh, so you need to understand uh, and compare with other sources and understand that, for example, in Bundesliga streams, uh, Betfair is crap. But in, uh, let's say, uh, Netherlands, Dutch football, it's it's good like this. Uh, you need to have lots of sources as you can, lots of streams, lots of TV channels, whatever you can, radio channels. Uh, and you need to compare for every league uh, and try to find the fastest way for each league uh, because it varies. Uh, it completely varies. I, I'm uh, trying to find the fastest source for 15 years and I'm still trying to find the fastest ones uh, because it's a key factor. Uh, but I can't say I, I found something very fast for all events. Uh, it's, it's impossible. Uh, so you need to uh, first collect as many sources as you can and then compare them uh, for each event. Uh, there's a question here for me saying, do you um, take into account the stall draw? You would do if you're doing in running. So drawn um, on the inside rail at Chester is going to have a massive difference in terms of whether you can trade that race in running successfully if the favorite is there. Um, but for pre-off, it makes no difference. Pre-off, I'm really looking at the front four in the field because they make up about 80% of liquidity in the market. And I'm, I'm less worried about things outside of that. Is, was that anything for me? I'm sorry. I was reading uh, a, a comment. I'm, I'm very yeah. sorry. He's, a, he's oh, asking South what? Coast, yes, yes. I was reading the South Coast. <laughs> and I caught my eye too. <laughs> um, you are asking what makes my scalping different than other people. Uh, it's it's a. Uh, it's a long story. It's not an easy thing to uh, say here, and it's uh, it's it's a topic of uh, of my course as well. Uh, so one of you asked something similar to this: If you both revealed all of your secrets, do you think anyone could replicate your success successes? I think this is a good question because my course is different uh, uh, from the others because I my course is totally live uh, with Zoom like this. Uh, I connect uh, to my pupils uh, like you uh, and I trade live. Uh, we watch the match together uh, and you completely see what I'm doing in the markets. Uh, I'm explaining all my moves. Uh, my pupils are not muted like you are uh, at the moment. They can ask me uh, live everything. Um, so they see what I'm doing, but if you say this is is this enough uh, to for you to replicate and be successful, uh, my answer will be it depends on you, uh, because you you are going to see all all of my not secrets. I will not call this as a secret because there is not a secret. This is a style. This is a uh, trading style uh, and you will see all, all of my styles but replicating this uh, is not uh, about knowing 
my style. It it requires some uh, other things. Uh, at least a, a strong psychology because I have losing uh, periods as well. Uh, in my first lesson, uh, I open my profit and loss screen to my uh, students and I show them. Uh, I randomly open one of the pages. For example, I open 16th page or 53rd page of my profit and loss and I show them my profit and losses uh, and they see that I have very big losses sometimes four five six or more in a row uh, so you need to be very very strong uh, psychologically to to cope with these uh, losses it's it's not very easy uh, to be honest it's very difficult because I have lots of friends they know how I trade they know my style uh, but they are not as successful as me uh, because we have a big difference with them uh, their psychology is not very strong and after a uh, loss series uh, lots of them completely lose their minds uh, and start to make mistakes uh, which makes them not a good trader. Uh, so, uh, as an answer for your question, anyone could could anyone replicate your successes? Yes and no. Uh, but in, in my course, uh, I I will show everything I I do uh, in the markets. Uh, they see they will they are able to see what I'm doing. Uh, after the course, I try to uh, follow them for, for a period uh, to allow them to, to encourage them to see their uh, faults uh, and, and the areas that they struggle. And, they, and I try to help them uh, for a period uh, through Telegram uh, or one-to-one -one talks. But it depends on you. It doesn't mean that if, if you know my secrets or know my learn my uh, trading style uh, it guarantees your you are a successful trader no uh, unfortunately no it's not that easy uh, we want to um, answer that um, very last question on, on the south coast and then maybe <laughs> that, it's been going for about an hour and a half now so I don't know if you want to round it off with that with that question on the south coast I think that was quite funny <laughs> The uh, Alistair is basically saying, what is it about the South Coast that makes a highly successful trader, given your connections to Southampton? So I actually think maybe it's if you support Southampton, then that's what makes you a really good trader. And therefore, everybody should support Southampton. <laughs> um, my answer is uh, I became a successful trader before I came to Southampton uh, because I've been living here for the last three and a half years. Before then, I, I've been living in Turkey. Uh, but I am very, very happy to, to be here uh, in the UK, in the South Coast as well. We have a very sunny day outside again. Uh, and we love sun uh, and warm weather uh, as Turkish uh, people because we get used to uh, this climate. Uh, Thank you. It's one and a half hour. Uh, thank you for joining. Uh, we are sorry if uh, there are some difficulties or problems in the in this uh, session or broadcast. I try to uh, allow everyone to join, uh, but the, the meeting is limited to hundred person. But we didn't exceed that number. I think there there were. There were a couple of people who uh, stayed outside of the session for a while because of uh, the limitations. Uh, but yeah, no, thank I think you for that, all. Yeah, generally it went okay, and there were some interesting questions, and we probably learned a bit about how to use Zoom during this as well. So, yes, yes, maybe in the future we can repeat the sessions if you are. Uh, okay, Peter, we, we can do this uh, again, uh, maybe. And we will be waiting for your comments about the session as well. 
Do you want anything to add while no, we are closing? Thank you for inviting me and for having this chat and thank you for everybody to come along and, and ask all those questions. It was a pleasure for me. Okay, I hope you enjoyed uh, as well, guys. Thank you for joining uh, and to see you again later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.